Some items of business, if you guys can make sure that you uh, have the volume on on your computer so that you can hear me okay. If not, uh, go ahead, type in the chat box and let me know. Uh, mute yourselves and also turn off your video. I find in the afternoon when I do webinars, it seems like a lot of people are on and the connectivity tends to be a little bit more slow. Um, but if we turn off our videos, which that I, I find type seems to seems to make a difference. Um, if you could also type is just a redundancy thing for me. Type your first and last name into the chat box. This gives me a second check um, because sometimes if you join without typing your name, um, I won't necessarily know who you are to give you credit for your for your attendance. So let me introduce myself to you guys. Again, my name is Linda Burrows and I'm the K-12 Social Studies and World and Native Languages Specialist here at ADE. Um, I've taught public school for 20 years in grades uh, seven through 12. And I taught French and Spanish in middle school. And then I taught English and social studies as well in middle school and, and high school. That is a picture of me and my, my family. Uh, about a year ago, my son graduated high school. He is starting his second year at Arizona State as a sports journalism major. Uh, my husband is a teacher in the Tempe Unified School District and he teaches high school there and social studies. And then my daughter just graduated from the University of Arizona with a triple major, one of her majors being Arabic. So that's been fun to see her. Uh, she took Spanish all through high school, but to see her language learning um, in Arabic in such a different language that you know you don't hear very often. Uh, so that's that's our family. And then I'd like to, um, as well as now that we've got kind of the attendance part, I'd love to know your current position, the language you teach, and and where where you're coming from as well as if you can rate your knowledge of the standards. Give yourself a one if you feel like you know the standards well, a two if you're somewhat familiar with them, or three if you're not very familiar with the standards at all. So if you can do that in the box, uh, chat box, excuse me, that gives me a really good idea of, um, one, I'd love to see where we are in the state, and two, uh, to give me an idea of where you guys are with your level of the, the standards. So go ahead and do that now, please. Couple of threes. Oh, good, Danae, fantastic. Not aware of the standards, excellent. Awesome, twos and threes. Oh, wonderful. Spanish one and AP Spanish lit five, six. That's a big difference in your day. <laughs> I've, I've had years like that where it's like you go from pushing your foot on the gas pedal to all of a sudden you have to like take it off and maybe even slam on the brakes a little bit between classes. Fantastic. Over in Glendale, I grew up on the west side of town over in Glendale. Fantastic. Nice of you to come, Fabian. Thank you. Let's see here. Don't teach. Oh, Tahona Otham. Fantastic. Thank you guys all for coming. Window Rock, I'm glad you could make it, Patricia. Fantastic. Reading specialist, EL coordinator. Oh, awesome. So these some of these strategies and standards will help regardless of whether you're learning English or learning any any kind of, of language. So wonderful. I am so glad you guys could all make it. And please, you have my email because I emailed you before. If ever you need anything, email me. Also, before we kind of move any further, um, I wanted to let you guys know that I will be sending out to you a copy of this presentation. So any of the links, references, slides you want to reuse, please feel free to use those. Usually takes me about a week to get those um, kind of processed and into um, into the system so that way you can print out your certificate uh, for professional development uh, from the ADE Connect. But also um, then I will send you guys out the, the email of the, the presentation. So fantastic. All right, so for our agenda today, we're actually gonna cover a lot of stuff. Um, we're gonna look at the actual standards. What are they? What's in, you know, in, involved with them? 
Um, we're also going to look at the difference and hopefully get you guys to understand more of the idea of performance versus proficiency and how performance leads to proficiency levels in language learning. We're going to be looking at the modes of communication um, that we have in our standards, examine cultural competencies. We're also, I thought it would be helpful to look at what assessments look like with the standards. What should you be looking at? How should you be making assessments, thinking of assessments as we're going forward, especially given this time period where so many of us, if not all of us, are online and and how those challenges and difficulties that come with that in teaching a language language online. And then lastly, again, I want to look at ways to create some cross curricular ties to kind of strengthen our world language programs. I think as we go go forward, that's a big concern of of ours as world language teachers is making sure that we create these robust programs that we continue them and that they don't get cut or on the chopping block given the fact that you know oh we need to focus on uh you know ela or we need to focus on um math and and oh forget about the world languages and and that's not what we want we want to make sure that we uh have our language programs be as um as robust and obviously as important as any any other language program or any other any other uh, program that's taught right so let's go ahead and let's start with our with the standards so the standards uh began and were approved in 2015 by the state board of education and formally adopted uh, that year the standards are different from the ones that were before and the fact that they are outcome based uh, they are based upon that performance of the student in our in our classrooms. They're not grade level based at all, which makes the world language standards look very different from, say, standards that you'd see in um, English or social studies or math or science. Um, and, and what that means is that you may have a second grader in a Spanish dual language immersion class that will have the exact same standards as a high school student in a Spanish 1-2 class. And so the standards are really written based upon the ability of the student to perform at a particular proficiency proficiency level. So the next piece of the standards is that performance of the student progressing through those different proficiency levels. And these are all all of the Arizona standards are based off of ACTFL, which is the national of teachers for uh, for for. Uh, for and so that's where it kind of comes from. So they've done a lot of the groundwork in this and then Arizona adapted it to kind of meet our needs at our at our state. So most students who are learning a new language will begin at a novice level, regardless of their grade or age. And as they become more familiar and proficient in the target language, they move up this scale, increasing proficiency to intermediate and then advanced and then on to superior. Uh, for most of us in a K-12 setting, your kids are really going to be in that novice to intermediate level. And then as you get into some of those higher level courses in high school, you will get some advanced, advanced speakers um, that have that kind of advanced proficiency level. And then lastly, we have our standards are organized into two categories. And these categories are to be taught simultaneously. So the first category is communication, and this includes our three modes of communication, which is interpersonal, interpretive, and presentational. And then we also have cultural competencies. And so this is the second category of our standards. And they should be taught again in, conduct, in conjunction with the three modes of communication. And our cultural competencies include target language, cultures, connections, and comparisons to communities around the globe that that speak the target language that you are that Plus you are one teaching. Four eight zero seven three four four seven six eight is now joining. There we go. Welcome. All right. So let's move on to proficiency. So they are not and they are not interchangeable, but they are related. So first, performance. Performance. What exactly is it and what does it look in the classroom? So performance is that practiced target language that's used in an instructional setting. And this is the language ability that's done within familiar contexts and content areas. 
Um, it is authentic and it does include real world use of the language. It's very often scaffolded learning that has teacher supports that help students practice and practice and practice and then perform the language, moving them on to, to that next level. Uh, when you're assessing student language performance, assessments should be done in the same communicative manner that the language was learned, practiced, and rehearsed. So for example, you don't want to practice one particular thing like maybe ordering food at a restaurant um, and then you give the kids an assessment on maybe going to a doctor's office or having to go to a pharmacy to get prescriptions because, you know, you ate something and now you guys are sick kind of thing. So you want to make sure that you always assess with performance what you what you practice. And that's kind of a key to it. Um, language in this case for performance should also be evaluated against any uh, descriptive features in, a, in a, that range range of context. And while performance can give some indication of proficiency, it doesn't um, totally mean that a student is, is proficient. So with proficiency, proficiency is when a student can demonstrate what they are doing in spontaneous and non-rehearsed uh, situations. And this occurs independent of how the language was acquired and the context may not be familiar or previously practiced in a classroom setting. Um, again, the key with proficiency is that it's that unrehearsed. It's also authentic to real world situations and how other native speakers that are unaccustomed to language learners communicate with each other. For proficiency, uh, teacher evaluations are not necessarily limited to the content of a particular curriculum, <coughs> excuse me, that has been taught or learned. So you can, to test proficiency, you know, ask students maybe something that you didn't exactly go over in class, but that would give them some time to think about it and come up with this sort of answer. Excuse me, just needed a little drink there. Um, students have to, when you're looking at proficiency and when you are evaluating your students on proficiency, one thing to keep in mind is that students must provide evidence of all the criteria in a particular proficiency level in order to be rated at that level. They can't be half above and half below. They would they would have to be all in one level before they could move on to to the next one. Whoops. All right, so let's look closer again at performance versus proficiency because this really is a big part of our, our Arizona standards. So when you assess performance, uh, you base that performance again upon your instruction. And so while it sounds like it's common sense, um, it is something that we do have to keep in mind that we always want to assess our students on what we went over in, in class. That practice is, is the key. Um, this familiarity also helps to lower that effective level of students that will then ultimately increase their ability to become proficient. And so the more familiar and comfortable students are with making mistakes, because we all know that it's when the kids make the mistakes to keep, that's when that learning kind of happens. And so they have to have that effective level be low so that way they feel comfortable, comfortable doing it. Um, the content and context, you also need to be very familiar. So making your lessons relevant to your students um, is what's kind of key there. So as you get to know your students in, even in this virtual kind of, of setting, um, create lessons that are relatable to them that they can do. Um, and then last thing, performance should be evaluated within a range. So that way you're getting all of those practices within that the students are demonstrating. So for proficiency, again, it's a little different than assessing uh, performance. And to start, your students can use this target language regardless of the situation or how the language was learned. Um, they go beyond those ideas of rote memorization and practiced phrases. Um, this also means that students' language ability and the use, um, they're able to convey those different ideas and convey them in a way that it would be if they were in a situation where you're, they're not with people that are used to being with language learners, that they're able to understand stand themselves. And that can be even at a novice level, they can be at a novice high, um, you know, when they can dem demonstrate that. 
And then lastly, proficiency requires at each level that students must demonstrate a consistent pattern of use at all times. So if not, and they're consistent once in a while, they're kind of operating at a lower level, then that's actual the proficient, the actual proficiency level at which the students are. So let's kind of practice just the difference between performance versus proficiency. So here I have a scenario for you. And what I'd like for you to do is I'm going to have you guys type whether you think this is performance or proficiency and you don't have to write the whole word if you just want to type out P E R F. If you think this is performance, that's fine or P R O F if you think it's proficiency. But here's a scenario. So after learning a unit on climate, students turn and talk about what the weather is like today. Would this be performance or proficiency? So if you can type that in the chat box. Fantastic performance. Let's see if this works. Oh, there we go. Hey, there we go. <laughs> All right, let's see. Next scenario. So students read a never before seen text and answer questions in the target language. Would this be performance or proficiency, do you think? Definitely proficiency. And it's that idea that it's that never before seen text. All right, next one, our teacher performs quarterly interviews of students. Would this be performance or proficiency? So this, you guys are coming up with both performance and proficiency. And again, if the teacher is asking them, I, I would view this one honestly more as proficiency. View them on anything that you know it would be where they're not giving you necessarily rote examples of this. Um, if you are maybe uh, interviewing them and expecting rote kind of things that they went over as a I don't know a dialogue in class performance, but I would view this more as a proficiency kind of um, example. All right, let's look at another one. So a teacher introduces a story to students. Students then use a whiteboard to retell, retell this to story to appear. Would this be performance or proficiency? Perfect performance. Because you're using and retelling the exact same story again. Good. Uh, let's see. We've just got a couple more here. Uh, students complete a quick writing assignment for two to three minutes after reading an authentic text discussed in class. Would this be performance or proficiency? Yes, you will be getting well. Hopefully the recording we will put online on our website. We are in the process of migrating our website. Um, and then you definitely will be getting a copy of this presentation. So this case because they are doing a quick write from something that they did in class, this would be more of a uh, performance, excuse me, a performance measure rather than a proficiency measure because they are repeating something that they did did in class. So it's already known known material. And then the last one, students prepare a multimedia presentation of new material as part of a final portfolio. Would this be performance or proficiency? Definitely proficiency, but you're right. It is it is prepared. Mm -hmm. Excellent. There we go. All right, so how these two things work together is perf think of it this way that performance actually leads to proficiency and that's how our new not our new standards, but that's how our standards work and kind of follow Actful's guidelines demonstrating how students learn a language and how they move from being a novice low learner to being an intermediate learner to being an advanced learner. And the more students practice, the more they move through these proficiency levels. And I will I have to say that if it is something where you have not challenged yourself to learn a new language in a while, this can be a really humbling experience from from an educator point of point of view. So for example, um, I obviously learned both French and Spanish in college. I taught French and Spanish at a middle school setting, but uh, three years ago this summer, I went to Bosnia on a Fulbright Hayes kind of group project. 
And part of the Fulbright haze was to learn BCS, Bosnian, Croatian, Serbian. And it is a Slavic language, which is nothing like the Romance languages or Latin based languages that I learned. And it was a very humbling experience to go all the way back to the beginning and be that very low novice learner. And it really did make me think about language learning in a different uh, way and in a different environment as I personally had to go through that same experience of, you know, starting at the bottom and being a novice low where I'm learning just vocabulary and how to say my name and how to ask for directions and moving through those those performance levels to get better and better to where at the end of the month, right, I could actually ask directions in a, in a random town in Bosnia to get to a library and, and a bookstore and things like that. So it's definitely a fun thing to think about as you are going through that, that learners kind of progress and they fall within those range and features. But the key is, is that they have to meet all of the requirements to move from a novice to intermediate, right? You have to have all of those requirements met in an intermediate setting before you can say you're an intermediate learner. So what do these learners look like? So we're going to look at these and take take some time here. Um, so a novice learner, right, will communicate with just basically words and phrases. Uh, they can express basic needs. Um, high, they are highly practiced and memorized. Many novice learners will need that sympathetic listener to understand them. Um, an example that I have that's kind of an easy way is like if a novice learner in a target language would say the word gloves or need gloves or I need gloves, right? Just very, very basic, basic sentences. So I want you guys to just kind of think and brainstorm again, trying to make this as interactive as possible. Brainstorm, what are some other examples that you guys have seen in those kind of novice or beginning learners? So when you think of a novice learner, what what are some of the characteristics that you notice in, you know, your those novice learners that you would see? A wait and see approach. Absolutely. Pointing to objects. Yes, I went to China once and the, it was wonderful when I, again, knowing no Chinese at all, um, that trip did not have any kind of language learning ability to it, but pointing to rest things to learn. List no verbs. Excellent. Yes, baño. Absolutely. Right. Responding with one words, drawing. Absolutely. Excellent. All right, let's look at uh, intermediate learners. So intermediate learners, <coughs> excuse me, are a little bit different in the fact that an intermediate learner can actually start to communicate with full sentences and even string together connected sentences. They can express uh, more elaborate needs, but still pretty basic, basic needs. Um, they do have enough accuracy in a target language where they can be understood pretty easily by that kind of sympathetic, sympathetic uh, listener. Another thing to think about with an intermediate student or an intermediate proficient student is that they will very oftentimes derive the meaning of the target language by comparing it to those of their native language. Um, and they'll try to recognize those cognates or just even recognize parallels with, you know, new and familiar structures within the target language. Like they're still doing that kind of translation in their brains. Um, they also will understand maybe some high frequency idiomatic expressions. Um, their range of vocabulary is quite a bit bigger. Um, and they can start to use some context clues to figure out what words may mean. Um, and they can demonstrate some comprehension when listening or reading to content that has a that recognizable format. Um, they also can identify main ideas of a text by using reading strategies such as like gleaning information um, or inferring maybe the meaning of unfamiliar words, like I said before. And then they also have a greater um, cultural understanding too for intermediate learners. They're able to kind of look at their own culture and that of target cultures 
to interpret maybe more oral and written texts accurately. They can also recognize um, influences in the, the target lung, uh, in the target culture um, and make those kind of interesting and great comparisons with their own. Um, so if we're using our gloves example from, from before, an intermediate learner would say something like, I need winter gloves because my hands are cold. And so you can see like you go from just saying, I need gloves or gloves to, oh, okay, I need winter gloves because my hands are cold. So you're, you're definitely getting that further, further establishment of that language learning. So what are some experiences with you guys that you have with intermediate learners? Like what are some things that stand out to you about students as they learn um, a language and kind of move up into that intermediate level? Yes. Mixture of tenses, absolutely, and getting transitions. Yes, yeah, speaking present tense, you know, but then maybe sprinkling in a little future, maybe a little past, but definitely communicates without con conjugating, absolutely. Any other, oh, gaining confidence. I like that, that's fantastic. And they start to volunteer. I think that's that's huge, getting the kids engaged. And that kind of goes back to that idea of creating that environment where it's okay to make mistakes um, because so many of them have that like embarrassed, I don't wanna say something wrong. Um, and that's that's huge. Oh, I like that, discussing versus just agreeing. That's fantastic. Difficult to communicate in full detailed sentences. Yeah, fantastic. Those are all excellent examples of, the, of that. All right, let's look at an advanced learner now. So an advanced learner, and again, you probably won't find this unless you have maybe like heritage speakers in an elementary or middle school setting, um, but definitely you'll see some students reach that advanced level um, in high in high school, but an advanced learner would communicate with sentences and having sentences being completely connected. They also will have a variety of time frames and extend that idea, you know, into the future and into the you know past participles and all that that goes along with it. They also will be able to have organized paragraphs. Um, advanced learners will be able to respond to and resolve problems. And they have enough control of uh, the language that uh, you will have them be able to pretty effectively interact with with people that are unaccustomed to to language. Language. You're right. Actually, yeah, you would have in deal programs. You would have many advanced. Um, so for our glove example, an advanced learner might say, um, you know, if gloves are on sale. When I get my next paycheck, I might go get a pair to keep my hands warm. So again, you're talking about much more complex sentences. Um, you're talking about, you know, looking into the future and in, in making those kinds of references. So thank you again for reminding me that definitely with um, DLI programs, you are going to get advanced learners as they those kids just progress through that because they soak up language like little sponges. It's fantastic at the in that elementary and, and middle school setting. Um, what are some brain with some ideas or other examples of say advanced advanced learners? If you can type those into the chat for me. They can make speeches, analyze reasoning, subjunctive, absolutely. Which that's fantastic. Again, um, with pre with uh, performance or even with uh, proficiency, you know, even for novice and intermediate levels, definitely having kids uh, make speeches even at those lower levels is still still pretty important in them. Still making mistakes, absolutely. Thoughtful language, I like that one. Complete sentences. T 
tonal qualities example oh a reader theater yeah fantastic that's a great idea inferences yep fantastic all right let's um now that we've kind of gone through the the main um levels that we're going to see in a k-12 setting uh, let's look at our modes modes of communication. So we have three modes of communication that are part of our Arizona world standards. And so the first mode we're going to look at is interpersonal. And so um, interpersonal is kind of this first mode of communication, and it consists of uh, active negotiation and meaning among individuals, meaning you're talking with other people, even if it is virtually or over chat, right? we're still communicating, we're still interacting in an interpersonal kind of manner. Um, participants observe and monitor one another to see how their meanings and intentions are being communicated. And so that's kind of this idea that you can pick up on that, that difference in the tone of voice and you get those meanings, which sometimes is harder, maybe like in a chat kind of thing or in a text message, but it still is an important form of, you're still communicating those, those meanings. Um, you do make adjustments and clarifications accordingly. And then speaking and listening in that conversation, as well as reading and writing um, via text messages or social, social media. So interpersonal communication is really anything that is done directly one-on-one -on -one or in a group or anything that is person to person. So some interpersonal examples um, would be uh, like interests and in reading, like a reading survey. So this is something that we could do pretty easily in an online setting, right? To get some of that interpersonal in, which is, I think, interpretive is, is an easier thing to do online, as well as presentational may be easier to do online. Interpersonal is one of those things I think teachers struggle with to do online given, given the setting. But this is like an activity where you could have a survey and have students use that survey in the target language. And then you can always adapt this to make it as complex as you wanted to for more advanced learners or as basic as you needed it to be for say a novice learner. But you could have students um, ask and answer partner questions in a survey. Um, if you have, uh, if everybody's online, you could have them do it like in chats. If you have the ability, say in a Zoom, to do like breakout rooms, you can do this um, where students can do it. And so like surveys that you can do would be something like a, a getting to know each other, like what's your favorite subject, pastimes, um, what obligations do you have besides school, uh, favorite movie, music group kind of thing. Um, you can also do other things too, like sending uh, screenshots or text messages, um, things like, you know, what does your family, does your family read in a language other than English? Uh, do, what does, like, what are things do that someone to pronounce words correctly, just asking and answering those kinds of, of questions. What books do you like to read? Um, so those are all kinds of ideas to do it. And then obviously include with those kinds of um, things, like any kind of reflection too, where maybe the student explains how they, um, what they learned about the other person is always, you know, get some more stuff into it communication wise. You could also, also do like a, a 30 second uh, speaking prompt where the kids just have to use words, pictures, you can divide up the class, uh, you could debrief with others. Um, you could also, again, make this as complex as you wanted, but the kids just have to speak for 30 seconds. And what the nice thing about the 30 second prompts that I find is that 30 seconds is not an intimidating amount of time. So again, it lowers that effective level. It they're not being graded on it. They're not being judged on it. So it's like, who cares? Just speak. I just want you to speak for 30 seconds. That's it. Go kind of thing. And what that does is that then just gets them gets them talking. And another example is a guided conversation. So this could be something where you uh, 
have a, a topic maybe, or you have two pieces of paper where you have student A and then you have student B, and they have to provide time and practice with the partner where student A is maybe asking directions to a place and student B is the answering person. And so they come up with a conversation where they're asking and answering questions. And then what you can do is all the student Bs in your class now have to talk to a new student A in the class and get that conversation going. So they're still using that same conversation, but they're doing it with, with, a, new, with a new student. Um, and you can create all sorts of kinds of conversations. You could do it like a phone call. You could do it maybe with um, asking to go to uh, a movie or to uh, meet up to maybe go walk to the local Circle K and get, you know, a Polar Pop or whatever it may be, right? Um, you can also scaffold this with uh, vocabulary. And the nice thing is, is that doing this where you have these guided conversations where you have a student that meets one role and another student that meets an, a, a different role, then that gives them, again, that kind of uh, comfort level. And you can mix it up and match it as, as you need to and add more or less to the scenarios as you, as you see fit. Um, another idea that I have found that's kind of fun for an interpersonal um, example, and this could be something where you could do this online, um, is easy or have students engage with their family members, is to do kind of a walkabout bingo where you have students have to find other students to, you know, essentially complete the bingo chart, you know, who writes mail emails, um, who has a favorite magazine, obviously they would be doing this and asking these questions in the target language. Um, you could make them, you could make it very easy where it's just vocabulary maybe, where someone knows what that word is or maybe make those inferences um, and they have to ask another student about that. Um, and then again, you could adapt this a little bit to have uh, the bingo be online or maybe with family members or something like that where they have to have to do it. But there are all different ways to ways, excuse me, to do um, that interpersonal mode of, of communication. So the next mode of communication um, is interpretive. So this mode of, mode of communication consists of reading, writing, speaking and listening, which I think especially the reading and writing is really easy to kind of do in this online setting. Um, and as we are getting into school more or as you know, everybody's kind of starting and, and ramping up now, um, it is important that you do need to make sure that you're doing not just interpretive, but you're doing interpersonal and also doing the presentational. Um, so interper interpretive mode of communication is interpreting basically what the author speaker um, wants, you know, was that message that they want to understand. It is a one way form of communication. So there is no negotiating back and forth. There's no discussing with someone about the, the meaning of, of what the, the text may be or what the song may be. Um, and it differs um, from comprehension and translation in that it applies really to the, the ability to read, listen or view and understand that within that kind of cultural mind mindset. So this is where, as we're looking at cultures and we're doing both our modes of communication with our cultural competencies at the same time, this is where finding those authentic texts, so texts that are created for um, native speakers or heritage speakers, right, that's what you would be using and then bringing in those cultural contexts to understand that there's a lot maybe going on behind, behind what, what is there. And again, this is this idea of, um, you know, one way, one way communication. Let's see, some examples of this uh, would be uh, jigsaw reading selections. So this could be something where divide up pieces of the text and have different students read different sections of it. And then you could have them come together and do interpersonal where they each then talk about what they read. And so then you're kind of killing two birds with one stone. 
Um, you can also have them follow directions um, like a recipe, a maze, or some kind of, of logic puzzle. Um, you can also find different kinds of short stories, uh, brochures that kids can read and then interpret. Um, um, and that is very, this one I think is the easiest one to adapt for online learning. Uh, you also have news and media. There's tons of news and media outlets in, in all these different target languages, so they're easier to, to And then also one thing you could use um, is, uh, whoops, social media to interact. One thing I wanted to show you guys, and let me see here if I've got it. Um, let's see, is I wanted to show you this here is a site and I apologize. I, I live in Old Town Scottsdale and so my internet is ridiculously slow. But I wanted to show you this site called lyricstraining.com and they have lyrics that you can use for all these different languages here. So my internet is going to be a little bit blurry, but then it should, um, it kind of comes back around and then it won't be, um, it won't be. But what's neat about this is you can take and you can uh, show a song on here and it will be in many different target languages. And so if I just select beginner and then press start here, we'll say maybe later. And what it will is it'll show the song here. Let's see, I don't know. Are you guys able to hear that at all? Actually, now that I think about it, it may not. Uh, let's see, when I click share. Let's see, oh, whoops. Let me go back and share here and turn on the computer sound, then you guys will be able to hear it. Okay, here, now we should be able to hear it here. So what this does, oh, whoops, no, go back. So it's nice, this will show you like part of the song and then the kids have to listen to it and then they have to type in what the, what the words are. So, oh, I didn't hear what it said. So let's see here. And so it stops the song and they won't be able to go on and then you just have to fill it in and it's just kind of a fun game to do something different and they have all of these different languages here that are fun that you could you know preview and see if okay are these age appropriate for your kids um but different languages that you can have them hear and and listen to it and do that interpretive kind of um mode of of listening so let's see. All right, so I wanted to share that with you guys there. So let's talk about our last, uh, last mode of communication. And this is presentational. And so presentational consists of the creation of messages that students have to inform, explain, persuade, or narrate something, whatever it may be. It like um, interpretive is just a one, one, um, one way form of communication. And it's made to basically think of facilitate um, interpretation by members of one culture to another. Um, there's no necessarily direct opportunity for negotiation, but you can always add that in where maybe you have students present something and then kids have to come up with questions to ask them. And then that would make it more interpersonal too, adding more, more to that. Um, with presentational form of communication, um, Again, the presenter needs kind of that knowledge of the audience's language and culture, um, writing messages, articles, reports, or speaking, telling a story, giving a speech, uh, describing a poster, um, or even visually presenting a video or a PowerPoint or Google slide. If you have kids do this online, that's all part of that, that presentational mode of, mode of speaking, right? Or, or mode of communication. Um, it is one way it can be drafted and edited. Um, it can be done by an individual. It could be done by maybe a group of students. Um, and so that's something to think about with the presentational. 
So some examples of this would be maybe students having like a spokesperson. Um, it could be also where they do a quick write and then share what they what they have written. Uh, a news report also works really well for this. And as well as a book report, a talk or a poster. Um, the nice thing with these kinds of presentational forms of communication is that this is where maybe especially like my husband has even said that now that he's been at school for a couple of weeks, he's noticing his students starting to lose a little bit of interest in the lack of participation in school. So this would be something where have students research content that they're interested in, have them get that buy in and do those quick writes or maybe they're going to be a spokesperson for um, an environmental issue that they feel strongly about. Um, and so have them develop that um, and and take that time to do that. And also that gets that kind of buy in for their for their presentational um, purposes. Right. Um, also have them keep in mind like the audience and who they are going to present their presentation for. Is it for the teacher? Is this for adults? Is this for peers? Um, and then depending upon like the different level of students you may teach, you may want to review different kinds of expressions that are common in in that in your culture that with the target language um, or maybe focus on a particular location or something too. Um, the key with presentational is obviously that kind of planning and organizing. Um, students can use things like graphic organizers. I think a lot of times in world languages we don't use graphic organizers nearly enough and yet they are a really good way to have kids um, organized ideas and thoughts, especially if they're going to be presenting presenting it to the teacher or to peers in that way. Um, and it also allows them to compose things in in that writing process. So it's just that that idea of taking the time to write in the target language and work on it and then using that to then translate that into an oral presentation is is huge in developing their their learning. All right, so let's now that we've gone through the three modes of communication, uh, which of the three modes of communication do you guys find to be the easiest in uh, in online teaching? Oh, great idea, Jocelyn. Thank you. I'll see if I can find that link and I'll put it directly in in the email that I send you guys. So if you can type in the chat, which of the three modes, interpretive, presentational, or interpersonal, which one do you think I think is the easiest to do in an online setting? Interpretive? Two votes for interpretive. Presentational, definitely. Okay, good. Presentational, fantastic, yeah. I think the interpersonal is the, the sticking point, which kind of leads me, oh yeah, with Google Classroom, to the next piece, which is, you know, which is the most difficult. And I, I think everybody can kind of agree that the interpersonal is probably the most difficult to get students engaged and to have them um, work with, especially in an on, in an online setting. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Jocelyn. So the grammar, here's my little nod to grammar, right? I mean, I definitely grew up kind of old school and, you know, grammar is, you know, important. But my key with grammar now after all these years is that really grammar, think of it as doing it with the language learning as opposed to really pulling it out and making it something that's a drudgery, something that's boring or, or separate. Um, and so here's kind of this is based off of the pace model, which starts as a grammar basically is that presentation of, of meaningful language. So as students are presented language in a whole way, like whether you are speaking it and say like a TPR kind of lesson, whether they're listening or reading it, or even watching a demonstration of it, or even like that video, that you know, music video. 
all of that is giving kids grammar. And so that's one of the ways to teach grammar is to just show them what it looks like in, in, the, tar in the target language. Um, also, attention is kind of the second step to, to doing grammar in, in more of a holistic way of, of doing it. And so this is where um, you as a teacher would maybe call your students' attention to the grammatical structures that are being taught. Um, you can isolate sentences where maybe a certain structure is observed or projecting sentences on a board or in a Google slide, um, highlighting maybe important words or phrases. Um, having students or, you know, having the students infer maybe some of those grammar functions or structures, you're bringing attention to it. But again, it's not something that's done like in a, a, just a grammar, grammar kind of lesson. And then you also have this idea of grammar as an explanation, as, as conversation. And so this is where like you as a teacher and your students would engage in conversation where as you are speaking to your students in the target language, you're getting them to understand first the meaning of that grammatical point um, and then ultimately the form. And so they move from maybe using infin infinitive forms of verbs to actually adding the endings and what they should be according to the sent to the, the conversation. But they're doing that through speaking and through listening rather than just, uh, OK, let's conjugate these verbs and, and having kids rewrite out the verbs and, and doing verb charts and things like that. Um, especially with novice level learners, you may need to use more of the student's native language first or using English you know, might be more necessary in this manner, but that's something that as you want to use the target language as often as possible to get that grammar across to them. And then also you can add different things in extension activities. And so extension activities with grammar, let me be clear, is not something where you're just giving kids worksheets to use in a target language to maybe fill in the blanks or, you know, hey, okay, here are disconnected sentences. Instead, Extension activities, think of them like information gaps where maybe kids have to role play situations. Maybe they're doing a dramatization or a game, um, some kind of authentic writing project, an interview, a survey, um, some kind of maybe simulation. But again, it's getting the kids to use that grammar in a real world setting and not being so focused on that rote memorization of grammar and it's it's learning it. And so in this case, um, I found for myself, right, I kind of had to let that go a little bit um, where you are um, essentially not as concerned with the grammar because the kids do um, ultimately get it, but it does kind of fit into that better. And so that's my little, that's my little blurb on grammar for you guys. All right. So let's look at cultural competency. So this is probably, and I will have to say, honestly, is my favorite part about language learning, is learning, learning the cultural, cultural uh, competencies. So in addition to our three modes, um, we do ask, and you are required to teach the, the cultural competencies, but what does that exactly mean? Um, this means that using the target language and use of the target language to investigate, explain, and reflect on relationships between practices, products, um, perspectives of the culture studied. And so um, for me, like for example, like when I went to Bosnia, right, because it was such a foreign foreign language to me where I, I didn't, I'd never heard Slavic language really spoken before. And there's so much history going on in the Balkans between Croatians, Serbians, and Bosniaks, and then there's all of the religious distinction between them, um, and yet the languages are exactly the same, except Serbian is written in Cyrillic as opposed to with more of a Latin alphabet. But learning that kind of cultural perspective is huge. Um, and what this means is it means taking the time to find those authentic resources to use in your classrooms. And, and this does require more time of you, but it's time that is valuable and well spent. And it's nice too that once you find these authentic resources, then you've got them and you can use them, use them over again. 
And so it's the idea with this is that we want our students to be more culturally aware of others. We want them to avoid cultural appropriation as well as giving them also that deeper insight into their own culture to compare the two. And that's what I always enjoy with my students is finding ways to compare the culture of the target language to their own culture. And again, getting that relevant to be um, to them. Um, the thing with culture too that I, I want you guys to keep in mind is that culture is not something to be done separately. This is as you are doing um, you know, your modes of communication, as you're doing your language learning, it doesn't come from a textbook, nor is it something that like, hey, we're having culture Monday, so let's talk about the food that is eaten in Spain, right? That's not what it is. It's about really interweaving the culture and your authentic texts with your students' language learning. So finding authentic texts is, is key. And so here are some ideas that are just kind of quick and easy that you can look at to find. And again, I'm gonna show you at the end of this um, some of my, my newsletters where I've got links and stuff to, to give you even more resources to them. But finding recipes from a target language culture, um, you can compare the cost of making um, food in the US versus the target language, which especially for those of you that maybe teach elementary or teach in a DLI setting, right? Teaching economics, uh, elementary school social studies now, and that can be really uh, intimidating because most people didn't major in economics. But this would be a really great way to talk about cost and and stuff where you're teaching language and you're teaching econ all at the same time. Um, books that mirror multiculturalism, children's books are great examples of this. Uh, short films that are animated um, could also be very, very helpful to them. And then bringing the world to them and travel. So this is something that I have found that not only traveling virtually, which is so much easier now than it ever used to be, but your own personal travel can bring so much into your, lang your students' language learning. Current events and news stories and newspapers, they're all online and very easy to find. And those are great ways to bring authentic texts into your classroom and bring in some of that culture, um, as well as comic strips, cartoons from different international sources uh, can also bring, in, uh, bring that into your classroom. So more with the cultural competencies, um, as, as part of it is that the purpose of this is that we want to build and reinforce that knowledge of other content areas in with the culture. And so this is where you guys as um, language teachers will help develop critical thinking and problem solving, but you also, it's tied to other content areas. And as you know, we really wanna make sure that we promote language learning that we, get our administrators to value language learning and, and think of it as a core subject as important as math and as important as um, you know ELA or science. This is where you guys with a little bit of outreach on from your part as a language teacher can really, really make that difference. So for example, with cultural competencies, you can use these to reinforce some of uh, core subjects. So you can use your target language to maybe supplement some of the history lessons that the, the social studies teachers need to teach. Um, you can use the teach about biology. And obviously in a DLI setting, this happens you know, already with math and science and social studies. But if it's not, if you teach foreign language in an elementary setting, this is a great way to reinforce some of that. Or if you teach in a middle school or high school setting where your subjects are, are separated, um, this is also a great way that you can show the value of language learning, but also, um, also do your, uh, don't worry about it, also do your, your language learning, but also show how relevant and important you are. And an example of this is, for example, um, uh, my, my last year of teaching, I was actually teaching um, economics 
and I partnered with the Spanish teacher in my in my school. And when I was talking about macroeconomics and and governments as a whole and countries as a whole, it was perfect because she was talking about Venezuela and what was going on as their cult, their economy was collapsing. So it was fantastic that the two of us working together were giving our kids this really rich understanding of the problems of the the country of Venezuela and what was going on with their uh, their economy. And the kids would go back and forth between our classes on given days and be like, oh, well, this is what happened here. And then they're speaking Spanish in my econ class. And it was just fantastic. And what that did was give this greater depth of understanding for the topics of our kids because we were partnering together. But it also shows that value, which I think is really, really important in today's climate that we make sure and speak loudly and proudly, honestly, about the importance of, of language learning so that it doesn't get kind of shoved, shoved off to the side. So here's what I'd like for you guys to do, because again, this is something that I just, I believe firmly in. And I honestly think that as we look at, at education nowadays and, and given the setting, this idea of a you know, not so siloed kind of way of thinking. Um, I want you to brainstorm and think of different ways. I'm just gonna give you like maybe five minutes to think of different ways that you could maybe connect your curriculum with other core areas. And just take a minute and then type that into, into the chat for me. Oh, I love the idea of teaching history from a different point of view. Art history is huge. That's great. I do like the idea, the idea of, of multiple points of view and especially like of marginalized peoples in that different history. Like I know there are a couple of you that are teaching up in Window Rock or you're teaching Danae. So teach history of what happened, you know, as far as with the reservation and the long walk. And that's all part of it that you can bring into your language classroom, giving that point of view and reinforcing that, which would be huge, I think, in, in, in doing that. Field trips are fantastic. And there's so many virtual things now that you can do um with museums and stuff like that because a lot of that stuff's not even open anymore absolutely science and tourism mm -hmm. the idea too if you think about it like if kids are learning something in their in their english classes like say a classic piece of literature um, have them look up and and read a classic piece of literature in the target language or you know something from an authentic authentic text in that way that you can even make those comparisons um, comparisons to that as well Fantastic. Okay, we are, I'm going to go ahead and move on just because I, there's so much I want to, to cover and I want to make sure that we get through it all. So let's talk about this and how do we now take those standards that we've gone through our three modes of communications and our cultural competencies. Now, how on earth do we make that work, work in our, in our classroom, right? Um, oh, I like the idea of a painter in English, art in ELA. That's fantastic. So how do you use the standards? So I would recommend starting with a backward design and really having a clear focus on what the um, performance should look like at the end of each unit. And we'll talk about what that may look like and what that is. And then once you come have this idea of what you want the kids to have at the end of that unit, then you go back and you have all of the activities and instruction that all leads to that, to that outcome. You'll want to start with more scaffolding, especially now at the beginning of the school year. And as the school year progresses, you'll start to take some of that scaffolding off, right? And do less and less with it. 
and then your target instruction in the current proficiency range. But you always want to be working and pushing and kind of nudging your kids into that next higher range of, of proficiency, whether they're going from a novice low to a novice mid or going from like a novice high to an intermediate low. Um, right. That's what you want to constantly be pushing them and edging them for that, but teaching that target language in, in the range that they're in. And don't feel bad to re about recycling and reusing content. There's nothing wrong with using content or doing a unit in, in one and then upscaling that proficiency level and adding more to it later on in the school year, right? So that's kind of where I would start, is I would start with, again, looking backwards, where do we want them to be at the end of that unit? And then all of those activities lead up to that and then you start with more scaffolding and then do less as as school goes as the school year goes on. So backward design, I would say start with your I can statements. And so this would be your I can statements are all through actful and, and necessful and they have them all online on their website, um, which I'm going to show you where all that is. But um, these are things that students it's basically answering what do you want students to be able to do? And so this is great because, again, it gets that student buy-in, that student engagement. Students will set goals aligned with proficiency. Like, why are you taking this, this language out of it? What do you hope to get by the end of this quarter, by the end of the semester? Um, and I think this is, is all fantastic with it. And then can you streamline anything? And so that's something also to consider, given the current situation that we're in now, is this idea of, you know, maybe we don't cover as much content, right? But we're doing more of that critical thinking and some of that social and emotional stuff. And you know what, that's okay. You know, it's absolutely okay. So determining what is essential. And so this would be time for practice. You know, how much time do you think you really need to, to practice this? What kind of checks for understanding do you wanna build into your, your lesson planning? And then again, keeping it simple, just like when everything got shoved online in the spring, right? I think teachers were very overwhelmed with, hey, here's free, 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 like all this stuff to do. And it was like, whoa, 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 like, I can't even process all of that. Um, and so think of your students in that same way. Keeping it simple, don't overwhelm them with materials and resources, but definitely, you know, use those things and, and get to it. Um, one thing to think about, and again, is that interpretive and presentational skills are done a little bit easier outside of class. And while they are easier online, now you may want to really try to focus your online learning with that interpersonal communication, or maybe going over some of those cultural competencies, or maybe some of those touchier subjects that, okay, we need to do this in more of an online where I can see my students kind of, of setting. And so that gets the interpersonal kind of, of in, in class. Uh, let's look at these I, I can statements. So I kind of took I can statements from um, an intermediate uh, presentational benchmark, right? And so you have a low, a mid, a high. And so if you're overall what you want the kids to get, you know, by the end of this unit, think I can communicate information make presentations, express my thoughts about familiar topics using sentences and a series of connected sentences through spoken, written, or signed language. And so this would be, right, where you want them to be at the end of this, right? And so how can I present information to narrate about my life experiences event? That's what we're gonna talk about. So a low I can statement would be, I can present personal information about my life, activities, and events using simple sentences. A mid would be a little bit further, right? Where it's like, I can tell a story about my life, activities, events, and other social experiences using sentences and a series of connected sentences. And then an intermediate high would be, I can tell stories about school and community events, so it's not just about me, right? And personal experiences using a few shows, and often across various time frames, which gets to, I believe Jocelyn, you had talked earlier about time frames. So that would be an example, example of that, right? And so with these I can statements, it's really clear from a student point of view what you 
are and are not able to do. And that's the beauty of using I can statements, especially with language learning, is it sets those kids goals and they know exactly kind of where they are in it's either you, you, you're there or you're not kind of thing. So it's really, really easy. And so I highly recommend using I can statements with your students as, as elementary as they sound, you know, oh, I can present personal information. Don't think of it that way. Think of it as this is the ability of the student to really recognize where they are in their language learning. So here's another example of um, intermediate presentational skills or signing examples. So an intermediate low would be I can retell a story that I've heard or read. Um, I can narrate steps of an experiment I conducted. So here you can get some science right into your language teaching. Um, I can talk about an experience related to my hobbies or activities for an inter intermediate mid. I can describe plans for an upcoming work week. Excuse me. I can present uh, comparisons between roles of family members in my own and other cultures or I can present my hypothesis about what will happen in a science experiment and provide supporting information. So again, within even an intermediate learner, you've got low intermediate learners, mid and high. And so breaking it up this way as you are doing your, your planning, really think where do you want those kids to be? Where do they think they can be? And it really becomes an easier uh, way of looking about, about this. And I know I just went through uh, through this, but I wanted to kind of just kind of touch base with you guys and just get an ear for what are some of the challenges that you guys have faced so far? Because I really want to talk about the challenges of instruction moving on further um, with the rest of the, the webinar. So what are some challenges that you guys have faced so far with kids um, in your language teaching? getting students to stay in the target language. I think that would be much more difficult online as opposed to in person when you can use your proximity to kind of stand closer to them or, or you know, look at them in, in that way that it's like, oh, okay. Young students not being fluent without parental support. Yeah, motivation is hard. I, I noticed, like I said, my husband has already started to notice notice that trying to get the interpersonal online. Mm -hmm. Computers are definitely challenging the lack of technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I have, I, I hear from, from people that are teaching and obviously I've, I've only been out of the classroom for a year now, but definitely that idea of um, having problems with connectivity um, is really, really challenging. And, you know, certain areas like on, on the, in the Navajo Nation, right, you have areas where you don't even have it, you know, so trying to get that or to get second graders or, you know, kindergartners that can't even, you know, read yet maybe, how are you getting them to do, use technology to do it and adults aren't there, yeah. That's definitely, definitely tough. So let's kind of talk about some of these, some of these challenges that we have. Again, I want this, you know, to make this as, as meaningful as possible. So some of my um, suggestions, right, with challenges of instruction, I think a lot of times with, as um, language teachers, right, we're kind of siloed and we're, we're by ourselves sometimes and, um, you know, or maybe like you're the only French teacher and, you know, or the only German teacher or the only Diné teacher, or whatever, in your school, you know, something to think about is to maybe plan together as language teachers in English. So get together and think, okay, what do we want for all of our, you know, novice mid students to do and, and do that planning in English and then adapt that into whatever target language you may be, may be teaching. Um, definitely, I would say don't start with the tech that you guys are familiar with. Don't try to start with all the new new stuff. And there are tons of webinars out there on new things to use. And I definitely would say 
start with your learning management system, whatever you may use, whether that's Google Meets or Google Classroom or Schoology, or um, if you're using Zoom or Canvas, start with that and see where you can use that the most. And then maybe pull in just one new piece of technology that could work and just get comfortable with that, get your kids comfortable with that one new piece of technology and see what that, that brings you. And then definitely capitalize and use class time for comprehensible input and other kind of in-person must. So think of your online time with your students as really your interpersonal time to get the most out of that. Um, and again, we'll talk about some of those different, different technologies. So for online teaching, some of the things that for interpersonal tasks that you could do would be different things like texting and sending messages. So there are different kinds of um, websites out there where you can pretend to be a person and send text messages. You could also send text messages through like a Google phone and stuff. And so those are also easier ways to maybe do texting or in the chat to do some of those maybe interpersonal skills online. If your school district allows it, video conferencing Right. I know some schools don't allow you to use Zoom um, because of just privacy issues, but um, I know like Google Classroom or uh, Google Meets has has those kinds of options. And then you also have different things like virtual pen pal programs that you can do where you can get some of those inner interpersonal tasks. And there is one and this was for those of you that didn't come to the um, ASLA conference last year, they had a fantastic speaker that is from a world language teacher in Texas. And he has a foundation called Happy World Foundation. And here I'll put the link actually here in the, the chat so you can get it. Um, and in fact, I'll put the link also for that uh, lyric, um, lyrics training too. Oh, let's here, let me go back to that. Oops. Um, and the Happy World Foundation thing, it's totally free, it's easy. And what it does is it will partner, you can set up your classroom to partner with people from all over the world. You can even, they have it set up so that way you can partner with people from, that are maybe like grad students here that are studying in the United States um, that speak your target language. And they do all these neat things where maybe you can have kids guess where they're from, by asking them questions in the target language. And so it's a fantastic school um, organization that really tries to pair schools and communities worldwide. So I definitely think that that would be um, a great way to, you know, bring in some interpersonal, uh, interpersonal skills online. So that's kind of a fun one to do. Um, interpretive texts, always look for those authentic, um, authentic texts. This is one that I'm, this is new for me. So I just thought it's new for me. I'll, I'll share it with you. There's an organization called Actively Learn or a company called Actively Learn. They do have, like most of them, they have a free subscription thing and they have a paid one. It is geared more towards social studies, but you can get on there and add in your own text. So you could find authentic text in the target language put it on there and what's great about actively learn is you can have kids read a certain section of your text and then they have to stop and they can't go any further until they answer certain questions about that text. And so then they can go for, you know, they answer the questions and then they can go a little bit further and then they get stopped again and they have to answer questions. And so this is a great thing. I'm just learning it. It's totally new for me, but um, I have found it to be kind of, neat and have a lot of opportunities for that. Google Slides is a great way to do interpretive interpretive tasks, as well as maybe a flipped classroom where the kids watch a video and then do something when they come to see you. Um, and then Edpuzzle is another good piece of technology for language teachers that you can use. So again, don't do all of these. I would say start with your learning management system and get really comfortable with that and then pick one new thing that you're going to get familiar with and, and go from there. For presentational tasks, good ones are Flipgrid, that language teacher, this works really, really well in a language setting. 
Pear Deck is another one that works really well with languages and Padlet. Although I have heard that Padlet has just recently also gone from being 100% free to being free and paid, or you get like five free ones, so you constantly would have to be like redoing your Padlets. But those are ideas that you can have kids use that I think are all really well suited for, for language learning. So with assessments and, and getting assessments in this kind of virtual setting, some things to keep in mind with this as, as you're doing your planning. Um, one is to move slow. There's no need to rush and less is more. That's kind of like my motto with, with this. You know, it's kind of a crazy time. Everything is new. Um, establish those student norms so students feel comfortable speaking and presenting their opinions in the target language in class. Um, use tools, tools, excuse me, that are standards based um, if you have access to them. If you don't, don't worry about it, right? Um, establish a baseline of where students are in their knowledge of learning the target language, and that's a good place to start. Again, those I can statements are perfect, perfect for this because it really makes it easy for students to, to understand that. Um, make sure your assessments are good for generating data that reflects student ability. Um, in this kind of environment, right, we don't want to just be assessing students for the sake of assessing students. Um, and that's what um, that's what I, oh, you want to go back to the previous one? Yeah, sure. Let's see. There we go. So those are just some of them. And again, I'm going to give you guys this uh, presentation in a PDF. So you will have all of these in here and I will link them, um, link all these to it so that way you can get them. Um, make sure your assessments have um, effectiveness to the curriculum, right? And have teaching and learning standards. Um, have the students do self assessments with those I can statements. It, uh, it's interesting, like originally, I remember just being really reticent. I'm like, these are so elementary. Why are we doing these? But now I am such a firm believer in how they can really help your kids understand where they're at in, the, in their learning. Um, create scenarios with your assessments. And that's a really easy thing to do where you're putting kids in situations and then have and then assessing them on that. And then also using authentic resources. Always, always, always. You want to do that as often as you possibly can. So different types of assessments, right? You can have achievement assessment that's designed to assess how much they know at a specific point or maybe about a specific certain topic, right? Um, you can have performance assessments that um, are the ability to, that should be used, not sue, <laughs> use the language in limited and maybe controlled situations. Um, these also can be good for goal setting and future learning. And then you have your proficiency assessments. And so these would be done typically like once a year. This is where you might use, um, if your district uses like the Apple test or stamp tests. Um, and this really shows to see how the kids have mastered the target language to use it in that real wor world context. And so here are just some examples of assessments. So surveys with room um, for answers. You could have emails from person to person. Right, you could have inner outer circles for speaking once we get back into into person um, in person classes. Um, you could have kids pretend to travel to a target language country and present that at a travel agency convention. Um, you can do formative interpretive reading tasks and again using different things like a T chart or other graphic organizers, debates, um, an ABC story or a basic paragraph. You could also do a gallery where students propose artwork um, mural to a committee. So that would be a fantastic way to maybe get some of that culture in um, as well. And then a composition essay that maybe just starts with a Venn diagram where you've got two opposing viewpoints and then you have to come come together. So those are just some some ideas there. Um, and so tying this together with other with other content content areas. Um, and so I'm going to zoom really quick through this because we've only got about five five minutes. But this is kind of where my nod to to service learning and languages. And in fact, I'm going to be giving a whole presentation on this at the um, Arizona Language Association's conference in September. But basically, service learning is the idea of combining community service with your curriculum 
and tying those two things together. And it works so well with world languages. And what that does is it has, um, it ties to the actual world readiness standards, but it also ties those links between proficiency, cultural competency and service learning. And again, this doesn't have to necessarily be where they're going out and doing service, you know, in today's day and age, they could do things like creating an infographic online for maybe something to promote like clean water or energy conservation or whatever it, it may be. And it also has a lot of cross curricular connections to it. Um, so service learning, I think, is a great way to do this because it does tie in um, students needs and goals. So again, this can tie in with some of those I can statements. It can also do all sorts of neat things where you get tied in with the community and bring that language learning or maybe some heritage speakers that live in the community can help um, volunteer. You could do school literacy nights, canned food drives, um, reaching out to senior citizens designing, writing children's books. I mean, there are just tons of different activities that you could do with your language classrooms that get kids to think of other people besides themselves, you know, because there's always something that you can do to help, but also build that language learning in a different kind of environment where the kids don't even really realize that they're learning their the target language. Um, here's just an idea too, that you could do like a, a season of service where maybe depending upon the month, you do different kinds of um, uh, different kinds of uh, service depending upon the month. And so they're all different examples here. So yes, you'll get all this on the on the slides later. And then also what I like to do is think of service learning tied to literature. So taking the literature, take a story or a book from class, identify some of the themes from that book, and then figure out maybe what actions you could take to it, what kind of service you could take from that, depending upon what the book is, right? You've now taken that language learning and, and taken it a step further. And so I think that's a, a fantastic way to look at maybe your, your service learning with, with your language learning too. And then lastly, and this is again, because I'm just one, it, it's kind of a real concern of mine to constantly be promoting that language learning um, is to make language teaching so valuable and thought of as a core subject like everything else. So tie it to other other topics. So like I had told you before, like social studies, um, you know, economic aid to undeveloped nations that speak the target language. Like there are all sorts of um, NGOs, right, that are non-governmental or organizations that are constantly looking for help, or maybe you just bring light to some idea or something like that. And, and you know, with the target language or with science, maybe you want to start a, a bottle campaign, water bottle campaign or whatever it may be, right, to promote some kind of um, environmental Thing with with that, but you do that in the target language, and so these are all ways that you're using the target language. You can get your school more involved and get the school excited about this, and then you maybe have kids that didn't think about learning a language that it's like, oh hey, we want to do this, or you know, especially like on parent night and stuff. Oh look at what our you know the language students are doing, and you know parents eat that stuff up, and it's like, oh well, I want my little Johnny to do that too. Two items of note, I know we've got just like a minute here. I wanted to do a plug for the Arizona Language um, Alliance. Oh, here, actually, I can just escape out of this here. And then I wanted to show you our, our newsletter here. So there is um, a great organization. This is the Arizona Language Association. They have a fall conference in, Sept in September. It is all virtual this time. I will put, this is the, um, I'll put it in the chat so you guys have it. This is to register for it. Um, and we've got a great keynote speaker that is coming. It's not expensive at all. It's only 30 bucks, but you get a whole day's of length. And I went um, last year, last year was fantastic and, and very well done. And like I said, I found out about that Happy World Foundation. So that's a great, uh, great plug for that one. The other one I wanted to show you is our um, World and ADE website. So this is our website. We do have our um, a newsletter that I put out every month. 
And I wanted to give you guys this link because I do it. It's K-12, it's for all languages. It's done in English as the target language, but um, it's resources, it's tips, it's tricks. If you sign up for it, um, if you come out here, this is our main website here that I've got all the old archived newsletters. So if you're struggling on something, you can come back here and look at it. And um, it's got different things um, that you may need or, or new tips and tricks. We also have a resource page here. We have a link to our Seal of Biliteracy page here. Um, we also have um, different professional development opportunities that you can link to. And for those of you that teach dual language, if you're not familiar with it, um, here are links here to kind of a grassroots dual language immersion network. Because we are a local control state, we don't keep track of that from ADE's point of view. But I, I was able to get these at least linked out there to it. So here's our main website here. And so I'll put that in the chat for you guys. And then one last thing before we go, if I can, just as again, a redundancy, if I can have you guys put type your first and last names into um, the chat box for me. That way I know exactly, because some of you might have joined um, and not put in your first and last name. And so I need, um, in order to take, give you guys credit for that, go ahead and type your first and last names into the chat. It will take me roughly about a week to get everybody processed into the system in the chat. At that point in time, then you will be able to uh, go into ADE system and you can print off your certificate for an hour and a half worth of PD development. I will also be sending you guys an email that has a PDF of this presentation and the presentation with all of the links in it as well, um, you will be getting. So go ahead and Thank you guys so much for coming. I appreciate it. Um, I'm, I, I would love any feedback. Like I said, this is kind of my, this is the first one I've ever done for World Languages. So any feedback that you guys can give me, I'd appreciate it. You can just email me at lynda.burrows at azed.gov. Um, or if there's any other specific kind of PD that you're looking for from a World Language perspective, um, please feel free to email me that too. I'm always looking for, for ideas. So thank you guys very much for coming. I appreciate it. I'm going to stop recording now. Have a great evening.